The season is over. We have been given a score of 205. That is slightly better than last year, but still bad. I do want to talk about how we've achieved our goals, though. Of course, not all of them. The Oakland Chronicle, the local newspaper, has a scathing article about our team's record, and team record is probably the most important goal for us to reach, according to John Fisher. But we did acquire an all-star when we signed Pete Alonso, or ex excuse me, traded for Pete Alonso. We have increased attendance, and we've built the farm. And although we're not a top six farm system, he is happy with the progress that's being made. We're going to work on our draft record. I think maybe getting, you know, Devin Taylor up in the big leagues or something like that would help. And then fan interest, we are a 37 out of 100 in terms of interest. I think the lowest we've been is a 15 right around when we started. So we need to sign interesting players to engage the fan base further. Long term, he's given us the goal of making the playoffs. And uh, our uh, deadline on that has not run out just yet. The budget for this year is $124 million. That is $4 million than it's been the past couple years. And uh, yeah, hopefully that'll allow us to improve the team. Colin Pochet has another option at $4.2 million with a $1 million buyout. We will actually be avoiding uh, this option. He wasn't that great for us this year, 4.75 ERA. We can probably find good relief arms on the cheap, hopefully, to replace his production. Matt Chapman also has an option. It is for $14 million. That makes him the highest paid player on the team, just as he was last year. We will execute it. He was a three-word player for us last year, and this is important. Locally, he's very popular because, of course, he has a great history with the Oakland A's. That's who he came up with. And if we were to uh, not extend him, we would uh, lose fan interest and lose attendance, and we don't want that. That's part of our goals. The international amateur class has been posted. These are the 10 players we will be inviting to train with us in order to scout them, and we will do so until January 15th, when we will begin the bidding war against all the other teams for their services. I would say this is one of the weaker classes we've seen so far, but there are still some interesting guys. These guys have five-star potential right here, although maybe the most interesting to me is Jai Ferris, an Australian outfielder. I do want to go ahead and extend D.L. Hall if he accepts this offer, which would buy out two of his free agent years, although this year being an option, this final year right here. Uh, if he accepts it, Sears and Hall will be sort of our two long-term signings, so we'll have two lefty starters to sort of be the basis of the rotation. Let's see if he'll take it, though. This is how we'll be doing the arbitration. We offered Brown a deal. We offered Hall an extension, F. Ross and Jackson. Again, these, these others are just one-year deals to bypass the hearing itself. We're going to non-tender Martinez and Medina because we really didn't use them this year. Uh, and uh, Tyler Wells because of the injury mostly and the fact that he had a 5 ERA the one year he started for us. And then uh, one interesting one to note is Mason Miller. And again, I've made a point of leaving uh, you know, some OG Oakland A's around. But Mason Miller, his expectation now is starting rotation. And he's fragile with 35 stamina. I, I could put him in the rotation, but I feel like I'd probably be better off trading him because I don't think he would last in the rotation. Not to mention the fact that his ERA has come up from about two to three and a half to, to closer to five uh, throughout this save, albeit with some you know great strikeout numbers. But but still, uh, as uh, given that he's getting up there in terms of his uh, potential arm money as well. Uh, you know, he could be a trade candidate for the offseason. Reese McGuire, I'm going to offer uh, an extension to. Push ain't Santander were not. I thought about the qualifying offer for Santander, but I think he would take it. I think he would take it if I offered it, and I wouldn't want that, so I don't think we're going to get a comp pick out of him. And then IKF uh, wanted too much or he wanted too many years, but we'll have to either sign him back for cheaper or sign someone who can play a similar role, someone who can be you know a good backup shortstop with Nick Allen off the team. But that's how we're going to do arbitration. It's time for awards. Here are your Gold Glove winners in the American League. That includes Gabriel Arias, who was the World Series MVP, as you'll recall, as well as Andres Jimenez, who was also on the World Series Guardians. For the National League, here's what it looks like. Pete Crow Armstrong just had a massive year last year. Just look at his offensive numbers combined with that Gold Glove and center. AL Reliever of the Year is Dustin May on the Texas Rangers now. Pete Fairbanks finishes second, but look at this. In third place, Ronan Kopp, our own guy in his rookie year, 122 strikeouts and 90 innings pitched, picked up eight saves. He will be our best and probably highest leverage reliever going into 2027. Uh, in the National League, it's going to be Clay Holmes for the, now for the Cincinnati Reds, but a lot of others receiving first place votes, Luke Little, Joe Jimenez, Andrew Nardi, and Camilo Doval. Oh, sorry, no no first place for Doval, but Nathan Wiles. Look at this guy on the Washington Nationals. Not the craziest ratings, but a great long reliever for them. Here are your AL Silver Sluggers, which features the entire Orioles infield. They've traded for Nolan Jones. They've got him playing third base. Look, the entire Orioles infield won a Silver Slugger award. That's unbelievable. National League, here's who won there. 
AL Rookie of the Year was Houston's Jacob Melton with Aralvis Martinez finishing as runner-up. We also had Ronan Kopp finishing fifth, so that's nice. Good to see. Uh, Emmanuel Rodriguez, unanimous for the Miami Marlins. Uh, excellent year for him. I also like Lonnie White Jr. finishing second. I'm a big fan of him in real life. Actually, I'm a big fan of both of these top two guys in real life. AL Manager of the Year is Stephen Vogt. Again, as Oakland A's, we like that. We believe in Stephen Vogt. And then it's Carlos Mendoza once again, the skipper for the Mets, taking the National League Manager of the Year award. Sandy Alcantara grabs the AL Cy Young award. He becomes one of just a handful of pitchers with Cy Youngs in both leagues. And then Yu Min Lin, who's a prospect I've been in on at times, uh, wins for Arizona. That's big. He's only 23 years old. Very impressive. Your AL MVP is Julio Rodriguez. It is unanimous. It is his second. He finished as a runner-up in 2024 and has proceeded to win it in 2025 and 2026. Very impressive. He is the American League's top player once again. And Corbin Carroll, unanimous. We checked in on him at the All-Star break, and he just kept on hitting. 376 average, 463 on base, 619 slug, 186 OPS plus, close to 10 war, 59 stolen bases, 22 homers, an unbelievable season for Corbin Carroll. This is how we're going to set up our player development lab for the offseason. Again, Joshua Muir's two-strike approach, an emphasis for us. He did manage to improve it last year, but uh, 251 strikeouts last year, that is an MLB record. We'll be improving plate discipline on Joey Ortiz, defense at third base for Geloff, and then improving control for D.L. Hall and Ronan Cup, and improving pitch movement for Hunter Brown. Probably about half of these will work out, but the one we're really going to cross our fingers on is Josh Muir's two-strike approach once again. Arbitration decisions are in. We actually lost on both Langoliers and Mason Miller, which were kind of the, you know, the biggest money, the most at stake. We won all these other ones, but, um, you know, that those had less stakes overall, I would say. International free agents have filed. As usual, there's another great starting pitcher. That is Muneyuki Harada. Oh, he's a reliever, though. Interesting. But he is an absolutely nasty reliever if need be. There is also a starter. Uh, let's see if I can find him. Yeah, this guy, uh, Somei Shimizu. Uh, these are fictional players, but they come from Japan. And there's another good fictional Japanese player, Akinori Osugi, a right-handed hitting outfielder. This year's free agency class is good, but it's not that good. It's headlined by Sandy Alcantara, who's the reigning Cy Young winner. He's definitely the best player available. Also available is Jesus Luzardo and former Oakland A's legend Walker Bueller. He went to Baltimore and had a 5 ERA, so we don't feel too bad about trading him at the deadline. Jonah Himes, a free agent. We have uh, one of those fictional Japanese players. Don Varsho, Joe Jimenez, David Bednar, Tanner Scott, Bruce Dargrad. Also a lot of a lot of top-tier relievers potentially available before we sort of start to get into that second tier of players. We're definitely going to make some trades this episode, but let us look at the trade history so far. The best players I've acquired through all transactions are Kyle Isbell, Braxton Ashcraft, and Matt Chapman. That's by war. The best I've lost, Mitch Spence, Tyler Soderstrom, and Nick Allen. Nick Allen went absolutely crazy down the stretch for Milwaukee. He expects to be their starting shortstop. We'll see if he can actually manage to do that, but he went absolutely crazy, and they really coveted him. I was surprised that they won him so bad that they would give us Joey Ortiz for him. But uh, looks like they did well on that trade, at least in the short term. Our best trade so far, definitely still that Kyle Isbell trade, because Estio Ruiz has not uh, provided much. In fact, I see he's a free agent, and I'm starting to wonder, hmm, hmm, fourth outfielder maybe? Expects to be a bench player, fourth outfielder maybe? But yeah, that's a look at some of our transactions. So here's our first of up to three trades this offseason. I found that Brock Jones has become a little bit superfluous, a little unnecessary just with the way our team is constructed. We have Devin Taylor making his way through the minor league system. We have Enrique Bradfield, who we like more just because of the elite center field defense, not that Brock Jones isn't capable of playing center field, but just as constructed, Brock Jones is not totally necessary for this team. He's getting up there in age. He'll be 26 this spring. I think it's time for him to move on and get a big league job. We're going to trade him to the Baltimore Orioles, who have been a frequent trade partner for us. We're going to get Owen Murphy in return, a pitching prospect, 23 years of age, who we could throw in the rotation very soon, although I don't know if he'll end up there. And then Dayan Frias, uh, who just sort of addresses the need we have in AAA of a guy who can actually somewhat play shortstop, which we, we didn't really have. So at least we get that now, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, complete this trade. While we're waiting for other trades to materialize, here's how I'll be filling out my Hall of Fame ballot for this year. Submit. Well, this is a pretty big one. We're going to see Mason Miller go away. In real life, Mason Miller right now is making a serious case for being, 
I don't know, the best reliever in Major League Baseball. He's been pretty incredible to start the year in real life. He has stuck with us throughout this save throughout the first three years. He wants to be in the starting rotation, and that's not something I'm comfortable with. Not with his fragile injury status, not with his 45 control, not with his 35 stamina. I just don't think it's the right fit. We're going to trade him to a Kansas City Royals team that hopefully will let him have that opportunity. In return, we're going to get one of my favorite players in real life, Vinny Pasquantino. When I see this guy, I see leadoff hitter, and that's something we haven't really had. We haven't had a good natural leadoff hitter. I think that's what Pasquantino can be for us. He has a long-term contract extension, which Kansas City will so graciously cover one quarter of. We'll also get Hunter Owen. This is an interesting guy. He has he has two-way player type ratings, although I don't think he's particularly interesting as a pitcher. And so his expected role is starting rotation. He's not going to get that from us. Um, but what we do get is a you know right-handed DH type, a replacement for, spoiler alert, we're probably going to have to trade Pete Alonso, considering we're trading for Vinny Pasquantino. Now, Pete Alonso going to his last year, let's see what we can get for him. But first of all, we got to make this trade, and we'll also get Spencer Arigetti. Arigetti. This guy's on the Astros now in real life. I should probably learn how to pronounce his name. Uh, But he has been traded uh, from Houston at the end of the 2024 season, ended up in Kansas City's bullpen. Actually, it's like he did pretty well in Kansas City's bullpen last year. Hopefully, he can replicate at least some of what Mason Miller did for us. In total, our money will drop by $2.5 million because of Pasquantino's relatively team-friendly deal and uh, Kansas City covering quarter of it. These guys are on league minimum salaries. Let's complete this big, big trade that GM John Daniels has mixed feelings about. I also have mixed feelings about it. And so with our final trade, we will be saying goodbye to Pete Alonso. We trade for him from San Francisco. He did not perform all that great for us in 89 OPS plus about a replacement level player. So we'll, we won't be too sad to see him go. All of the fans will be sad to see him go. Locally, he is popular. So this is one of those trades that's going to hurt the fan interest, which is not great for us. One of our goals is definitely to increase that. New York Yankees are in win now mode. And uh, in order to afford his contract, we will have to cover 25% of it. But again, that's only for this one year. So not a huge deal. Uh, In return, the main piece will be Judd Fabian. I like Judd Fabian. I think he could fit really well into this team. I'm picturing lineups next year, for example, where maybe versus right-handed pitching, you know, we have Enrique Bradfield in center and Denzel Clark in a corner. And then maybe versus left-handed pitching, we move Clark back to center, bench Bradfield and Fabian takes over in a corner spot. I could see something like that. It's good to have. He's kind of a right-handed version of of Brock Jones, which, uh, you know, we really wanted just a right-handed version of Brock Jones, the way this team is constructed. So I'm happy to have him. And they've also been nice enough to offer us some nice sort of minor league depth. These guys aren't necessarily incredible prospects by any means, but they're very usable minor league players. And so I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Yankees. This guy is actually probably the most interesting just because he's 20 and he has high work ethic and high intelligence, and he's a starting pitching prospect. But uh, I'm probably not going to add any of these guys to the prospect list, but it'll just strengthen our system overall. And because the Yankees are in win-now mode, they're willing to part with them in order to acquire a player like Pete Alonso. So we'll complete this trade, and that'll complete all trades for this offseason. Winter meetings have started. Here are the results from the draft lottery. Last year, we made it into the lottery. This year, we did not, despite having a pretty similar record. So kind of unlucky for us. Lucky for the Marlins, though. They had the eighth best record with 71 wins, yet they will be picking first. Although I almost always wait on free agents, I have jumped on Ben Bowden. I have offered him one year, one and a half million. That was his demand. He's never really uh, played in the major leagues, but he wanted a major league deal. Actually, he did play in the major leagues. Let's see his stats from back then. Um, okay, so yeah, they're counting 2021 with Colorado as his year of service time, but he has good ratings. He really does. So, uh, I wouldn't mind having him in the bullpen for one and a half million. He is yet to, uh, fully go with our offer, but I suspect he will sign with us. Rule five draft time, time for me to protect who I want to protect by adding them to the 40 man. Owen Murphy, for sure. That's a, that's a very easy one for me. Adrian Santana is eligible. I just, I just can't see anyone picking him. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll risk it for the biscuit. Who I will protect is Gunnar Hogland because he represents important organizational pitching depth even though I have not said his name once this entire save. Place him on the 40 man. Dayon Frias too, we traded him for a reason because he could actually play a competent shortstop. We need that in our minor league system. Put him on the 40 man as well. We have space on the 40 man for these guys. So I hear Hope is another prospect we've traded for that's eligible, again, not seeing it. And then the others, I guess the big ones would be these two sort of 
catching prospect, catching depth, organizational depth, whatever you want to call it that I've traded for. But we still have Silas Ardoin. We still have Daniel Sigler. So I don't, we don't really need to add more catchers to the 40, man. It's time for us to pick in the Rule 5 draft here, the first few picks so far. This is a more interesting Rule 5 draft than we've seen. This guy, Christian Hernandez, could be like a really fringy starter. Miguel Sano is in here after slugging 700 in AAA, grand across 25 games. Remember when he was on our team? This guy is a Pirates prospect I'm uh, actually interested in in real life. Uh, so it's fun to see him get picked here. I wouldn't have, I actually probably wouldn't have minded picking him, just looking at him right now. But we'll see if there's anyone interesting we can find as it's our turn to pick. I mean, J.J. Blade would obviously be fun. That would come full circle. We've talked about Estuary Rees being a free agent, but I don't think he quite fits what we're trying to do. No, the guy I definitely want is Bryce Montez de Oca, known for his pretty nasty stuff. He can run it up to 100. Not a lot of control, but could be interesting to see. Just, you know, if he has a good spring, he could make the team and be in our bullpen. Ensign Duran, who we just traded for in that Pete Alonso trade, did get Rule 5 by the Miami Marlins. That's okay, man. Have fun. He's low leader, low work ethic anyways, so uh, I'm not sure if I'd necessarily want that guy around my organization. Hmm. Ben Bowden has signed with us. It took him some time. He really had to think it over, but he has signed with us. That's a guaranteed $1.5 million for him. Not bad considering he hasn't pitched in the big league since 2021. Zach Geloff has concluded his improved defense at third base in the player development complex and uh, it hasn't gone particularly well for him. I feel kind of bad for him. We've we've kept him around, even though he doesn't totally have a carved out role, but we just like him, you know? We just like him. We just want to have him around. I don't care that he's selfish. I'm selfish too, Zach. January 15th, international amateur free agent signing has begun. We scouted our 10 guys. We looked at them. I got to tell you, the standout for me is still Jay Ferris, that Australian outfielder. I don't know if we'll land him, but we're definitely going to try. Okay, so very weird thing just happened. I don't know if I like it. Uh, I offered Alvaro, Pacheco, and Jay Ferris at the same time. That added up to about the budget of it. And I said, okay, we'll get in the bidding war. We'll drop off on Pacheco most likely and go after Ferris, but I want to just get the bid out there. Pacheco immediately signs with us. Here are his uh, projections as far as the ratings go. And uh, on the same, on the flip side, now we cannot afford Ferris because we've offered X amount of money to uh, Pacheco that's been taken out of our budget, and now we, the Phillies have beaten our offer. So uh, we didn't land Ferris. Uh, I don't know if that's a, that's a, I guess that's a bit of a misplay on my part, but you know, at the same time we get Pacheco for, uh, you know, a, a less money than I thought. 3.2 million to be exact, so that gives us two and a half more to play with. All right, well, I do know I want Julio Carmona. This is a first. This is a reliever prospect all the way, but he's a fastball slider guy. Great ratings across the board, high work ethic. Let's try to at least get this done as a consolation. Okay, Julio Carmona signs with us. That's nice, I guess. And that means we got about 1.2 million left to play with. All right, let's offer this outfielder, Daniel Uloa. Again, it's been just kind of a mad scramble. I didn't even really get a chance to scout this guy or invite him to practice. But uh, yeah, that that kind of, oh, nope, his, his offers are way up, 4.2 million. Wow, okay, let's find someone else. Heading into February, trying to spend the rest of our international budget, uh, I see Luis Castellanos, a previous international signing for us. Some of his projections have gone down a bit, but he still projected 80 power, and he's still a 65 framing catcher. I mean, what's not to like here? 11th ranked prospect in the game, and he should be ready to start in uh, graduate from the international complex and start in rookie ball this year. We, he probably could have done it last year, but we kept him in for a little bit longer. Zach Brixey, though, the velocity dropping quite a bit, the stuff dropping... It's a shame about him. I was excited when we got him, but uh, things haven't quite panned out. Although, honestly, he, you know, at least he got a lot of strikeouts last year for us, 55 and 40 innings at the big league level. All right, I grabbed this guy, Luis Caceres, for about 500000 I only grabbed him because high work ethic, high intelligence, and some good defensive ratings. As you can see, the bat isn't that amazing. Jay Ferris has signed. I want to see how much for, though. That's what I really want to know. Okay, so it was going to cost the entirety of our international budget to get him. That makes me feel a little bit better about spreading the love instead. Jeremy Pena is a free agent. His expectation is bench player, and that's probably what we'd sign him to be unless Joey Ortiz really faltered, in which case we could slot him into shortstop, but... I'm very willing to sign him at this point in the offseason. It is February 9th. His demand is not too high. And uh, yeah, oh wow, yeah, not at all. So I will be happy to sign Jeremy Pena for that, were he to accept it. 
And a similar situation here with A's legend Paul Blackburn. I don't know if he would make the team out of spring training at all. The rings don't look that great. He's been hurt. You can see what his career looks like since he left Oakland. He was great in 2025 with Washington, but not a lot of action in 2026 with Kansas City. What we can absolutely do, though, is offer him one of those contracts that turns into a major league deal if he makes the team out of spring training. Uh, so I don't know if he'll make the team, but we'll definitely offer him because he is an Oakland A's legend for sure. And again, we talked about it already, but similar setup with S to Yuri Ruiz. We do have Judd Fabian, who I think is probably a better version of Ruiz in some ways, but we can still try to land Ruiz. What if Fabian gets hurt? Then I'll be glad I at least had him in spring training, and then he would end up probably making the roster. So let's do it. All those guys have signed. None of them guaranteed roster spots, but they'll at least be in spring training with us. Pena, probably the best chance to make the team out of those. And uh, we have added a catching prospect as well for 360000 It is this guy, Wilson Hermosillo. Jacob Wilson has successfully improved his second base defense in the player development complex. I like that. Here's how the rest of the complex is set up for now. It looks like DL Hall is doing well at improving control. He could be on track to do that. And Josh Mears, two-strike approach. We will make you a contact king one step at a time, Josh Mears, I promise. Actually spending the rest of my budget on this guy because he is German. I'm going to sign Willie Castro to a similar deal as the Jeremy Pena one, and I think they'll be kind of duking it out for one roster spot, but we're here at spring training, and we're about to find out. But yes, it is indeed time for spring training. Here are all the pitchers who will be joining us in Arizona this spring. And here are all the position players, the batters, who will be doing the same. I'm excited to find out who makes the team. February 26th, we have our first spring training injury, but we got off pretty easy on this one. It's going to be Ken Waldachuk with a dead arm. He was actually pretty good for us in a brief stint out of the bullpen last year, a 2.2 ERA in 16 innings pitched. He is merely starting pitching depth at this point, though. We've got a March 1st player development update, and it's awful news. Awful, awful news about Enrique Bradfield Jr. as he's trying to break through into the big league club. Potential contact and eye dropping, but the biggest one, look at his current defensive rating at center field, dropping from 70 to 60. I think at one point he had 75 range in center field. Now it's a 65, and that's really killing a lot of the excitement of getting him into this team, potentially. Another injury here, Paul Blackburn sprained ankle out six weeks. That hurts for him. He's trying to, you know, make this team out of spring training, doesn't have a guaranteed deal, and I would say this definitely hurts his chances of making the team. Here's the news out of the player development lab. We weren't able to improve Joey Ortiz's plate discipline, Ronan Kopp's control, or Hunter Brown's pitch movement. However, I think the two most important developments we actually got. We got Joshua Mears two-strike approach, outstanding, and we got DL Hall improved control, outstanding. I think both of these bode well. Well, this one hurts just at the end of spring training right here. J.P. Sears, torn meniscus knee, out five months. That's going to put him out till August, approximately. So he's going to miss most of this season. And he's been, you know, pretty much our ace throughout this save. Uh, he's been our best pitcher uh, overall, for sure. He was not great in 2025, but great uh, in the years surrounding that. So that really hurts. What's funny is Rick Jamison is so legendary at preventing arm injuries, it feels like our pitchers suffer weird lower body injuries instead. But yeah, this hurts. This is the first major pitching injury we've seen all safe, so uh, we've been lucky in that regard, but that's going to really cause a shakeup in the rotation for this year. Now that spring training is over, it's time to pare down the 42 players on our active roster to the final 26. All right, opening day, and this is how we're going to line up. And one thing I'll say, what I like about this team is there's a lot of different options and permutations as far as how we want to arrange things. So this is by no means permanent. I'll probably shift things around to sort of play the hot hand at various times. But for right now on opening day, this is how we're going to line up versus right-handed pitching. That will include Vinny Pasquantino leading off, playing first base. We're going to try something interesting here. We're going to try Langoliers DH. Reese McGuire catcher uh, because Reese McGuire does have superior defensive metrics and we can get Langoliers into the lineup basically every day this way and Langoliers has been you know last couple of years one of our better hitters so we can have him DH versus uh, right-handed pitching Ryan Noda we're gonna have him starting in the left field actually not bad ratings at left field I know he's played some corner in real life for for Oakland at times or in the minors at times but uh, not bad rings at left field for him at all. Josh Mears we're rooting for. You know, maybe don't set like the strikeout record. Jacob Wilson moves down to third. But yeah, this is how we're setting it up. And then Joey Ortiz, hopefully going to be a long-term answer for us at shortstop. If not, Jeremy Pena has also made this team. So uh, he could be uh, an interesting competition as well. 
outfield wise here's Judd Fabian here's Estier Ruiz I was so disappointed with the Enrique Bradfield news I'm gonna leave him in AAA for now although there's a good chance he'll be back up at some point in this season we'll see versus lefty is a different look Jacob Wilson leads off this time You'll recall he improved his defense at second base. That was a project for him. Pasquantino, meanwhile, falls down to uh, seventh. Judd Fabian enters the lineup. This is at the expense of Noda at the moment. But Judd Fabian, look at his ratings versus lefties. This is what we brought him here to do. We brought him here to match lefties. He can play really good defense out there and left as well. Uh, and could also play center in a pinch if need be. Uh, Zach Eliff also enters as the DH. He will bat fifth in that scenario. And that's how we're going to set things up. Oh, yeah, and by the way, uh, Shea Langlier's back to catching, uh, and he'll bat third. Pitching-wise, it's kind of a mess right now without J.P. Sears, but D.L. Hall's going to be our ace. He's definitely our best pitcher ratings-wise. Hunter Brown is going to be in this rotation. He did well for us in the rotation last year. Sawyer Gibson Long gets another crack at it, but, you know, there's competition for these guys kind of on the back end right here. Spencer Arrighetti's going to be a long reliever for us, and Owen Murphy's down there in AAA as well, so we have options. Bryce Montez de Oca does make this team. We have him in an in avoid high leverage spot. Owen Murphy, it was kind of down to him and Owen Murphy, and I decided to send Owen Murphy down because, you know, I can. I can't send Bryce Montez de Oca down. He's a Rule 5 guy. Michael Kelly makes this team. I don't like that his personality class is selfish. That, that means we have two selfish players between uh, him and Geloff, but, uh, and I'm trying to take these splits off, but uh, in 2024, which is the first year of this save, he was arguably our most effective reliever. And then 2025, he struggled, and we spent most of the year in AAA and came back up for us a little bit in 2026, but he's going to make this team, although there is competition, and the negative personality traits certainly do not uh, help. Ben Bowden makes this team. We gave him the guaranteed deal. He had an excellent spring training. Scott Efros here in middle relief, but then use more often role. And Zach Jackson is going to be like our seventh inning guy. Joe Boyle, our eighth inning guy. And Ronan Cobb, who was so good for us last year, is going to be our analog for a closer. I know I always use the stopper role. But if you look at these secondary roles, this is more how uh, they're really going to be used. But it's, 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 it's based on leverage. You know, these are high leverage guys. But yeah, that's how the team is going to set up going into opening day. But it's definitely going to change. Because in AAA right now, we do have Bradfield. And I really wanted to just like versus right-handed pitching have Bradfield in center and push Clark into a corner. And that was back when he had, you know, 75 outfield range and was like a 70 rated center fielder. This is less exciting to me, but we'll see what happens. And then uh, Hunter Owen is another interesting guy. We've got him down there in AAA because we want him to learn first base. He was been used as a two-way player at times, but I think he's a power-hitting right-handed first baseman for us. I don't know quite how I'd fit him into the lineup. Probably some platoon involved with Noda uh, is how I'd probably try to fit him in at the DH spot, maybe at Geloff's expense. We'll see, but uh, we're going to leave him in AAA for now. He was part of that Pasquantino trade as well. Thank you very much for watching this series. I've been having a good time with it. I think this is a great edition of OTP. This is the most fun I've had with OTP in years. And so I thank you all for tuning in. I'm looking forward to what we can do in the 2027 season.